one of the cool things that that I found is is that some people really just revolutionize a field by cre- by creating a problem that didn't exist before. It's kind of like why I love science is like I, I engineering is like solving other people's problems, <laughs> and science is about creating problems. <laughs> I'm just much more like I want to break things and yeah. you know create problems. <laughs> yeah, uh, not necessarily move fast though. But, <laughs> <laughs> but one of my former mentors, Marsha Johnson, who in my opinion is one of the greatest memory researchers of all time, she comes up young woman in the field, and it's mostly guy field. And she gets into this idea of how do we tell the difference between things that we've imagined and things that we actually remember? How do we tell, I get some mental experience. Where did that mental experience come from, right? And it turns out this is a huge problem because essentially our mental experience of remembering something that happened, our mental experience of thinking about something, how do you tell the difference? They're both largely constructions in our head. And so it is very important. And the way that you do it is, I mean, it's not perfect, but the way that we often do it and succeed is by, again, using our prefrontal cortex and really focusing on the sensory information or the place and time and the things that put us back into when this information happened. And if it's something you thought about, you're not gonna have all of that vivid detail as you do for something that actually happened. But it doesn't work all the time, but that's a big thing that you have to do. But it takes time, it's slow, and it's, again, effortful, but that's what you need to remember accurately. But what's cool, and I think this is what you alluded to about how that was an interesting experience, is imagination is exactly the opposite. Imagination is basically saying, I'm just going to take all this information from memory recombine it in different ways and throw it out there. And so for instance, um, Dan Schachter um, and Donna Addis have done cool work on this. Demis Hassabis did work on this with Eleanor McGuire and, and UCL. And this goes back actually to this guy, Frederick Bartlett, who was this revolutionary memory researcher. And Bartlett, he actually like rejected the whole idea of quantifying memory. He said, there's no statistics in my book. And he came from this anthropology perspective. and Short version of the stories, he just asked people to recall things. He would give people stories and poems, ask people to recall them. And what he found was people's memories didn't reflect all of the details of what they were exposed to. And they did reflect a lot more. They were filtered through this lens of prior knowledge, the the cultures that they came from, the beliefs that they had, the things they knew. And so what he concluded was that he called remembering an imaginative construction meaning that we don't replay the past. We imagine how the past could have been by taking bits and pieces that come up in our heads. And likewise, he wrote this beautiful paper on imagination saying, when we imagine something and create something, we're creating it from these specific experiences that we've had and combining it with our general knowledge. But instead of trying to focus it on being accurate and getting out one thing, you're just ruthlessly recombining things without any, you know, any necessary kind of goal in mind. Um, I mean, or at least that's one kind of creation. So imagination is um, fundamentally coupled with memory in, in both directions. I think so. I mean, it's not clear that it is in everyone, but one of the things that's been studied is some patients who have amnesia, for instance, they have uh, brain damage, say, to the hippocampus. And if you ask them to imagine things that are not in front of them, like imagine what could happen after I leave this room, right? They are find it very difficult to give you a scenario of what could happen. Or if they do, it would be more stereotyped, like, yes, this would happen. This, would. But it's not like they can come up with anything that's very vivid and creative in that sense. And it's partly because when you have amnesia, you're stuck in the present. Because to get a very good model of the future, it really helps to have episodic memories to draw upon, right? And so that's that's the basic idea. And in fact, one of the most impressive things, when people started to scan people's brains and ask people to remember past events, what they found was there was this big network of the brain called the default mode network. It gets a lot of press because it's like thought to be important. It's engaged during mind wandering. And Mm -hmm. if I ask you to pay attention to something, it only comes on when you stop paying attention. You know, so people, oh, it's just this kind of, you know, 
daydreaming network. And I thought this is just ridiculous research. Who cares? You know? Um, but then what people found was when people recall episodic memories, this network gets active. And uh, so we started to look into it and this network of areas is really closely functionally interacting with the hippocampus. And so, in fact, some would say the hippocampus is part of this default network. And if you look at brain images of people or brain maps of activation, so to speak, of people imagining possible scenarios of things that could happen in the future, or even things that couldn't really be very plausible, they look very similar. I mean, you know, to the naked eye, they look almost the same as maps of brain activation when people remember the past. According to our theory, and we've got some data to support this, we've broken up this network into various sub-pieces, is that basically it's kind of taking apart all of our experiences and creating these little Lego blocks out of them. And then you can put them back together if you have the right instructions to recreate these experiences that you've had, but you could also reassemble them into new pieces to create a model of an event that hasn't happened yet. And that's what we think happens. And when I'm, our common ground that we're establishing in language requires using those building blocks to put together a model of what's going on. Well, there's a good percentage of time I personally live in in the imagined world. I think of, I have, I do thought experiments a lot. I, you know, take the, uh, the absurdity of human life as it stands and uh, play it forward in all mm -hmm. kinds of different directions. Sometimes it's rigorous thoughts, thought experiments, sometimes it's fun ones. So uh, I imagine that that has an effect on how I remember things. <laughs> and I suppose I have to be a little bit careful to make sure stuff happened versus stuff that I just imagined happened. And this also, I mean, some of my best friends are characters inside books that never even existed. And I'm, you know, there's some degree to which they actually exist in my mind. Like these characters exist, authors exist, Dostoevsky exists, but also uh, Brothers Karamazov. I love I that book. Yeah. It's one of the few books I've read. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few literature books that I've read, I should say. I read a lot in school that I don't remember, but Brothers Karamazov. Was but they exist. Alyosha. They exist, and I have almost kind of like conversations with them. It's interesting. It's, uh, it's interesting to allow your brain to kind of play with ideas of the past, of the imagined, and see it all as one. Yeah, there was actually this famous mnemonist. He's kind of like back then the equivalent of a memory athlete, except he would go to shows and do this. Uh, um, that was described by this uh, really famous neuropsychologist from Russia named uh, Luria. And so uh, this guy was named Solomon Sherashevsky, and he had this condition called synesthesia that basically created these weird associations between different senses that normally wouldn't go together. So that gave him this incredibly vivid imagination that he would use to basically imagine all sorts of things that he would need to memorize. And he would just imagine, like, just create these incredibly detailed things in his head that allowed him to memorize all sorts of stuff. But it also really haunted him by some reports that basically it was like he was at some point, you know, and again, who knows if the drinking was part of this, but he at some point had trouble differentiating his imagination from reality, right? And this is this is interesting because it's like, I mean, that's what psychosis is in some ways, is you, you know, first of all, you're just learning connections from prediction errors that you probably shouldn't learn. And the other part of it is, is that your internal signals are being confused with actual things in the outside world. Right. Well, that's why a lot of this stuff is both feature and bug. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, I mean, it might be why there's such an interesting relationship between genius and psychosis. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're just uh, two sides of the same coin.